Hi, this is James Gray. Welcome to another episode of the James Gray Podcast. And I'm really excited to share this discussion with Professor Vasal Sachdev, a clinical associate professor of business administration at the Geese College of Business, University of Illinois. Uh, in this discussion, uh, we talk about how Professor Vasal has reimagined an undergraduate course using AI tools for the first time. We get into exploring a number of the different uh, technologies he's used in this course and actually shows some of these tools in action. Uh, he also shares some of the lessons learned as a professor teaching this class for the first time and how the classroom experience will evolve in the near future. We get into talking about um, how the curriculums will be changing now that uh, knowledge is free and accessible and how that is influencing the role of a teacher as more of a curator and community manager. He shares some of the recommendations of how students should approach learning using AI and some recommendations to professors and instructors on how to get started to bring AI into the course experience. I hope you enjoy this discussion with Professor Vishal. Hi, this is James Gray. Welcome to the James Gray Podcast. Today, I'm excited to welcome Professor Vishal Sachdev, a clinical associate professor of business administration at the Geese College of Business. He has served as director of the Illinois Maker Lab, a 3D printing lab since 2013, and the academic director of the new MS in Business Analytics program since 2021. He's also a faculty uh, in residence at the Discovery Partners Institute in 2023 to 2024. His primary area of focus lies in the applications of blockchain and AI. And over time, he's been actively teaching courses on blockchain and Web3, recently completing a comprehensive blockchain analytics course. He's also engaged in establishing a network of students who will contribute to research in this field alongside faculty members. Their research endeavors are supported by grants from various protocols and foundations, including Solano and Filecoin and others. Recently, he's been focusing on experiments in leveraging LLMs and education with some prototypes built for by students and teachers. He is also the member of a task force dedicated to exploring the applications of AI, particularly chat GPT in the field of education at the Geese College of Business. Professor Vishal, welcome. Thank you, James, a uh, pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to, great to have you. Um, and I'm excited to, for us to really kind of explore this, this last piece I just talked about and around your interest and what you're doing in education around LLMs. Obviously you teach in a, a, a technical university and the business analytics program. Um, and so perhaps you can tell um, and share a little bit about the course that you're teaching this summer and you know what are some of the reasons why you've you've been looking and utilizing the role of AI uh, in this course? Certainly, I think uh, everybody's trying to figure out you know whether this is uh, you know going to pretty much disrupt everything we do in education. So the only way to figure out is to experiment and learn. So that's what I'm trying to do, and several other faculty, and there's a lot of. Uh, a uh, lot of initiatives on campus to try and um, pull together some guidelines and, you know, learn from what we're doing. So this uh, summer course was a good opportunity um, to try some of the things. I, you know, I tried stuff in spring as well and then, you know, wrote up some grants. So have, uh, you know, different experiments going on, some tied to a course, some not tied to a course, some... Um, for our uh, online presence on Coursera. But this particular uh, experiment you know, going on right now is for a introductory IT strategy course, which is uh, asynchronous uh, online. And uh, many students, uh, mostly business students who are taking information systems uh, as a major, but several students from across campus who might be taking a business minor and because this intro IT strategy course is part of that minor so I get a mix of students uh, and given the fact that it's an introductory course it's an overview right we're not going deep we are going broad mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the knowledge that we are trying to get students to uh, sort of get through the course is really about the business value of technology and 
you know, of course, there's a core uh, foundation that they all need to know, but there's also a significant focus on emerging tech. Uh, and given the fact that like tech is changing, you know, every few weeks right now in terms of capabilities of new models, new tools, uh, almost any textbook gets outdated like, <laughs> within a few months. So this is where, you know, I thought that there is enough of a uh, sort of general knowledge base and particularly with large language models that we could explore how we could try bringing in this technology and embed it in the course rather than worrying about, hey, how am I going to catch <laughs> students cheating, you know, cheating and sure. doing this stuff. So that's the, that's the motivation. Yeah. No, thanks for sharing that. Um, you know, and it's interesting that you say, like, given the pace of technology, right, uh, and, and especially for technical curriculums, right, things are changing so fast. And so embracing that and bringing that into the classroom. Um, and so I'd like to imagine myself as um, a student in your in this in this course this summer. Um, perhaps you can talk a little bit about the course around how it would differ, how it is differing from how you taught this course in the, in the, in the past. Sure. So um, I guess, you know, I already said asynchronous online and it's not a big uh, enrollment course uh, for the summer. So I mean, I have 30 students, I've taught it uh, in this format for about five odd years. Um, um, undergrad uh, students, of course, mm -hmm. and eight weeks. So typical structure, you know, in, in, in my online courses is a focus on um, for students to, you know, I usually talk about frameworks, concepts, and then they apply these things uh, many times with discussions. So a lot of peer learning. And then towards the later half of the course, they're actually learning some tools, you know, learning SQL, learning maybe Tableau, learning... Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, in this particular instance, they're actually going to learn how to use some AI based tools to create, <clears throat> uh, create a prototype of an app, right? So they come up with a business idea, mm -hmm. leveraging some of the concepts and frameworks they've learned in the first four or five weeks. And then the last few weeks are more technical, right? So that's the typical structure. Mm -hmm. uh, so discussion oriented peer learning, um, uh, applying frameworks concepts to their lived experience, or if they don't have that experience, you know, undergrads, of course. So they actually do research and then apply to uh, the examples they find. Okay. Uh, so how it has changed this, uh, this semester, right? So my earliest, uh, given that it's a broad, not deep intro IT strategy, I even, exp you know, sort of, flirted with the idea that what if we just drop the textbook? I use an online mm -hmm. textbook. It's, you know, it's very good. Uh, but if, you know, given that these bots are, uh, you know, we are using GPT-3.5 as the foundation for the course, uh, last train till, I think, September 2021. So, and, you know, the textbook was last updated probably a similar time, maybe, maybe fall 2022, I think. All right. So the knowledge base yeah. technically of the course um, and of uh, the textbook, you know, if you look at the, what the knowledge base of the board and of the textbook is about the same, of course, you know, a textbook has been curated by a, a professor and they've right. collected a set of case studies collected a set of concepts that students need to learn about. But um, I felt that was like too big a jump, right? Not just for, uh, you know, you're not just thinking about yourself as you're thinking about students as well, making a jump from a structured textbook. I usually supplement with articles and videos mm -hmm. to a completely unstructured uh, experience where you're talking to the bot to figure out and you know ideas were to make it to have students write a textbook but you know thankfully i stopped short of that because to do this online async uh is going to be a big challenge um, so what i instead i did was look for opportunities where i could replace 
um, sort of the research that students were doing and use the bot, make them do more research because it was easier to do research with the bot. Uh, and given that the bot doesn't actually do any, um, you know, doesn't cite sources and can sometimes hallucinate, mm -hmm. the student's job was to synthesize, you know, so I'll, I'll share an example soon. But the research was done with the help of the bot. I mean, of course, they were reading the textbook. They were reading a couple of articles. They could research outside as well. Uh, but I asked them to do more faster with the help of the bot and then synthesize and respond uh, inside. So most of these are discussions. Now, when we get to the later, I'm, I'm still in what week five or week four or five of the course. And then they're going to start working on the project where I expect to give them, you know, AI assisted tools to do more in a shorter amount of time. So that's the, yeah. uh, that's the change this semester. Yeah, no, that sounds really interesting. So I, you know, what I hear is, you know, through these technologies, right, being able to, right, kind of accelerate the learning, do more, leverage these tools but also be able to kind of synthesize their knowledge, right, around what they've gathered and demonstrate that and, and show that um, as they're doing, um, right, it sounds like some of these more <clears throat> kind of hands-on projects during the latter, latter part of the course. Um, so I'm curious, you know, we've talked about some of these technologies a bit. Perhaps you can, we can talk and go into, you know, what specific AI technologies are you using this course and, and, and for what purpose? Sure. So, I mean, I started experimenting in spring with, with an, you know, one activity, one week, and that course was a little bit more technical, focused on databases. Uh, and there I was specifically looking at options where I could have multiple students speaking to the bot at the same time. You know, again, trying to leverage uh, peer learning, right? So because mm -hmm. very often... Even when you think about regular discussion forums, right? If you look at a course question and answer forum or any forum, you know, 90% of the people don't ask questions or maybe 95, right? It's the 5% who ask questions. Uh, and I expect that, okay, even if you've given them a bot, uh, many students will not know what to ask, right? So the initial idea was look for an interface where I could have multiple people talking to each other and also have the bot as a support. Uh, and then they could learn from, you know, student one asking the bot, student two asking the bot and student one and two talking to each other, everything. is so the bot becomes sort of like a- uh, Kind of a member of the classroom almost. Member of the right? classroom, <laughs> yeah. just with an infinitely better memory, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And instant responses, right? So that was not available in any chat interface right because all of these are single user chats yeah so i was fortunate to find an interface that uh you know was developed by uh you know a de you know a developer actually a software engineer who's doing this on the side uh and you know he branded it as erin so that's our name of our bot uh, and mm -hmm. you know people can look up it's erin.ac uh, the website name uh so th that provided me Discord and Discord, you know, for those who not used it, is like any other communication platform. It has channels, private channels, you know, ch for one person or multi user channels. So I used a combination of that. Um, I can, you know, I'll briefly show that interface uh, in a bit. Um, backend was GPT 3.5, and recently, you know, we've got a bigger context length with. Uh, GPT 3.5, 16K, so we can feed the bot more information to train it uh, because that's cheaper. You know, GPT 4 is more expensive mm -hmm. uh, to use. And I provisioned that uh, server, added the Erin bot, and the Erin bot is driven at the back end by GPT 3.5. Um, and you know, so the students are not paying for any of that. I sure. uh, provision that through the university. 
right? Uh, so that's specifically for running this course. And then we are doing some other experiments to build some bots that might work in our Coursera course. You know, I have some uh, content on Coursera. So we are building that on hugging faces using Langchain and, you know, Gradio as the front end. And, you know, we'll uh, put a link in the show notes for that sure. as well, maybe. I can show that on the screen. <clears throat> so that's the broad. Uh, so it's not not very heavy tech, right? Most of this, you know, hugging face, lang chain, radio, everybody can try with even for free without getting into paid. And right. those who want to explore the capabilities of a bot sitting inside Discord, if you want to see what I have used, that also has a free tier, so you can get a taste of you know what level of customization you can do. Right. Of course, the developer did some customization for us to allow us to uh because i had you know the the setup was uh and i can probably now share my screen to show people uh, sure. uh what it looks like and yeah, i will be, be sharing um just my conversations with the bot in a private channel because i don't want to share the student uh Right. You know, student experience, student messaging for privacy reasons. So what you um, are seeing on the screen is a private channel that I've created. And, you know, I have a developer working with me, uh, Rohan. So, you know, this channel is sort of he and I are on this channel uh, in Discord. Um, and every student gets a private channel like this. And we pre-trained the bot in each private channel with the basic outline of the course, learning objectives, deadlines, grading, you know, grading distribution, and not much else, right? So every other piece of information that you might see <clears throat> on the screen in a private channel for each student is essentially leveraging the knowledge base of the bot without any custom training by me. We have other channels which are set up specifically for a particular activity where we did train the bot and that was made available to all students to work together, right? So I'll explain that okay. activity, but let's give an overview of what what the student experience might look like. So sure. you know, I'm Vishal Sachdev, I'm chatting with the bot as a student and in the first couple of weeks, we are talking about frameworks and strategy frameworks applied to, you know, technology-based uh, business model. So here's a question asking me, uh, the bot about, you know, explain the five forces model to me by Porter, and it does a reasonably good job. And, you know, you can ask it to apply it to company X, company Y. It'll do a reasonable job of explaining that uh, model to you. So in some weeks where I'm talking about these frameworks, I might give the students a prompt, you know, uh, think about a couple, you know, a few firms, look at this framework and apply this framework to these firms. And I will usually ask the students to do more because they can do it faster using the bot. And then I will ask them sure. to synthesize. Right? Uh, I sometimes even give them prompts. So moving down, students can do sort of low stakes uh, testing of skills by just asking the bot to pose questions. So I've given them some of these prompts at some time, right? Saying, talk to the bot, ask it some questions, understand this concept, ask it to test you, uh, mm -hmm. and then apply it, you know, to a particular form. Right. Uh, and so, so this, this maybe yeah. just, maybe quick question. <clears throat> Um, just and it may, maybe not be obvious to other people. So this particular channel, just so I understand it, is is um, I think you mentioned that you've got multiple channels, and each of these channels, some of them, are uh, specifically geared towards certain certain content. Is that is that correct? Yes. Okay. And that in that specific channel, let's say I don't know, you know, you've got this one here around the Michael Porter Five Forces model. Yeah. Part of that is, as you said, is trained on that specific channel. Part of that is just trained on, uh, right, some specifics, as you said, around, I think you said it, some, something around around the, around the curriculum. So you're, you're kind of um, 
in a bit kind of augmenting and shaping that particular channel with yeah. your your course information and but obviously leveraging right the the gp knowledge base but kind of bringing those together in a in a very curated channel is that is that close yeah yeah so what you can do is you can constrain the student experience not just on the content but you can constrain it on the interaction so you can ask the bot to act you know can you can have the bot take on a persona right take on a persona of a teacher and the audience is you know people who are business majors non technical who are trying to achieve these learning objectives and then you can constrain the bot not to give direct answers but lead the student to an answer you can yeah. you know constrain the bot to do you know after you explain a particular concept follow up with two questions so that the student reviews the concept yeah so you can constrain on content and you can constrain the interaction yeah and right. I, I would imagine that kind of breaking these down i'm just guessing it'd be great to hear you say but kind of breaking these down by you know these channels makes it a bit more fo focused and curated around yeah. the specific topic and as you said being able to constrain kind of the, the content and the answers right because otherwise you've got right you've got huge right uh kind of yeah. tying into to huge masses of information absolutely so i mean so broadly to recap the structure every student has a private channel so this is a student private channel experience i won't be able to show a multi user channel because of privacy concerns but you can imagine that you know one exercise we did was uh you know the you know does it matter as a source of competitive advantage you know pros and cons you know mm -hmm. for and against views and students actually were assigned positions saying it is ubiquitous you know everything is in the cloud uh it is now required for com competing and it opens up a lot of risks so it's not really a source of competitive advantage and you know one set of students uh speaking the given the opposite position yeah yeah now in one channel uh we actually um you know stop shared here we actually uh train the bot with the readings for that module right uh and um i asked the students go first so i created two channels one with the bot trained on it matters as a source of competitive advantage another channel mm -hmm. with the content trained on it does not matter right and the bot was constrained to act as a debating partner to help the student fine tune their position right so the bot is it does not matter the student mm -hmm. is assigned the position it does matter uh so the student makes up an argument uh, based on the readings and submits to the bot and the bot responds back right or okay. you, you can start and saying you know the bot yeah. creates an opening position and says okay what do you think and the student gets back and says here's what i think here's how i come back to you and then the bot comes back and then they refine their position and they post their position in the forum in the class website we use canvas canvas and then there the students debate with each other so okay. that was a custom channel where every student was assigned to interact with a bot that had a specified content base and a specified way to interact with the student yeah and in this I example think... are the students seeing each, <clears throat> each other's chats no. with the no okay. in that case it was private so one channel okay multi user access but private access with each uh, each chat was private to the student but i just had to train one channel one bot with whatever i needed sure yeah okay so I think, <clears throat> I think you also said that part of the learning experience if i heard you correctly was the fact that right unlike other bots right that we use every single day which is single user right this is bringing more of a collaborative type right environment to this chat experience is that is that true 
Absolutely. So, I mean, we started, you know, initial first couple of days of the uh, semester, we encourage students to use a, what we call a course Q&A bot. So one channel uh, trained on, let's say, the syllabus, right? And then I had a quiz based on the syllabus uh, saying, uh, you know, making sure that students actually read the syllabus and the um, uh, students could talk to the bot and find out answers or they could talk saying, okay, what's the grading? You know, mm -hmm. how does the grading look like? You know, what kind of project do I have to do? What is the late submission policy? Uh, so there everybody was asking and everybody could see each other's questions and the bot was answering real time. Yeah, no, I think that's, that's really interesting, right? Because as you said, part of this environment, right, is helping and learning from each other. Yeah. Um, and having that bot experience where people, right, in, in, in cases like this where, right, you're learning about the syllabus, um, I, I, would, I would imagine this kind of group experience is, is actually pretty beneficial to the students. Certainly, yeah. I mean, I think that's what we were trying to go for. And this just sort of speeds up and scales up our ability to uh, not have to worry about, you know, adding more resources as more students get added. I mean, this is a 30 student class, but we are, these experiments are funded with our online programs unit, which runs the online MBA and several other programs. And there we are talking about thousands of students. Wow, yeah. So some of these prototypes might inform uh, what happens in these, you know, thousand online. student courses. Sure. Yeah. Sure. 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 Um, anything else on the, I think you touched upon a number of the technologies that were, were used. I think you've gone through them. You've demonstrated, right. Uh, the discord using Aaron, which really kind of allowed you to right hit the ground running and, and use that, um, you know, so, use I mean, that we environment. Are also using, uh, so this is of course the student experience. Um, I'm also trying to use this to improve what the instructor knows about the students, what the instructor mm. can analyze about student activity, because it's a discussion oriented course and many courses are, and you know, 30 students, yeah, you can look through the posts and understand and okay, I know this person is good at talking about this or this person is mm -hmm. weak here. But you know, as that becomes 60, 100 or 1000, those things don't scale. I mean, even with a 30 person class, if you've got a discussion forum in a week and you've got you know, one post and two responses, you're at hundred posts. Sure. Uh, and you know, you don't always have the time to read through hundred posts. So here's where again, you know, language models can help. So what I've been trying is, so we use canvas and we do a discussion, right? So I can show a small demo of what I tried with, uh, you know, there's an icebreaker activity in the first week because this is asynchronous online, you know, students may never see mm -hmm. each other. Um, so I asked them to do what's called an eight nouns activity, right? Introduce yourself, eight nouns, describe each noun in a couple of sentences. Okay. Uh, now with all of that, you say you, you want to figure out, okay, you know, do I see more people focused on sports, right? Or I see a lot of people with, you know, tennis, my son plays tennis. So, you know, people are talking about their interest in tennis and, you know, Wimbledon is going on and maybe I can talk about technology and AI applied to how tennis scoring is done or tennis reporting is done automated way, right? So, right. but I need to understand that, right? I need to say, okay, uh, from all the, you know, 100 posts, what do my students really like, right? So that's an icebreaker. I do another activity where I ask them to tell me uh, how do they think, uh, you know, sort of their short-term and long-term career plans and what's the role they think about technology in that career plan and what skills are important and how they plan to build those skills, right? Just as an exploration mm -hmm. in week one. Now that's again a narrative. Everybody's talking about goals, skills, but I need to understand, okay, what's my audience here, right? Sure. Are we looking at more technical people, more non-technical people? Are we got more people who want to be traders one day or consultants one day? 
and then you can appropriately uh, customize your next meeting with the students or your next email, maybe even customize an interaction with each student, right? Right now we don't have that level of automation, but the tools are all there. It's just about integrating all of it, right? So maybe sure. we could have a situation where I'm reading their introductions, their career goals, and I'm able to, or the system is able to customize a learning path uh, tailored them. to their interests, to their goals, and then also tailor the curriculum to that, right? I mean, there are some platforms. I think if people want to look at a vision of that, uh, I think Khan Academy seems to be proposing their new AI uh, sort of chatbot, which seems to provide a truly customized, real-time adaptive system available with a language interface. I think I'm excited to look forward mm -hmm. to that, uh, hopefully by the end of summer. But maybe that same thing is possible in the near future automated, but right now it's possible with a little bit of hacking together a solution. And the good part is that language models allow you to hack together those solutions by writing the code for you, right? I've done that, right? So I asked a language model, GPT-4 is good with code, to give me code how I could extract the discussion post from Canvas. And Canvas gives you an API, instructors have access, TAs have access, so get that API key, you know, put that code on a Google Colab notebook and, you know, in five seconds, you have 500 posts extracted from a discussion forum, right? But analyzing that, what do we do? You know, feed that to uh, the bot. Now, different bots have different capabilities. And just yesterday, uh, you know, Anthropic launched Claude 2, Dude. which has a huge context length. And that is good for a lot of text analysis. Uh, GPT code interpreter is again, you know, commonly launched for everyone like three, four days back. Mm -hmm. uh, it does a lot with data analysis and, you know, can do graphs and stuff, but it can't do text analysis very well. So I will share a sample of an analysis I did uh, using uh, the Claude 2 model. Claude 2 on the eight nouns discussion analysis. Um, on sure. the screen, so and I've I actually asked the Claude model, Claude two model, to anonymize student names itself, so the names you're seeing are not real names, but what they said about themselves in their introductions is is uh, real. I think maybe I can see if I yeah, can. there you go. Yeah, I was gonna say yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, perfect. I'll zoom in uh, a bit. Yeah. So you know, this is about thirty students. Every student's post, you know, they eight nouns, they talked about that. <laughs> and then, uh, um, you know, if I scroll down, uh, I said, you know, anonymize. So I had also participated in that. So I don't mind sharing my own name. Uh, but all the other names are uh, fake names, right? Uh, so I, I was able to talk to the model saying, okay, show me what this person said. You know, it was able to pull that out. And, you know, you can note I'm a procrastinator. I'm working on it. <laughs> so so, this, I, so this is, this is you, the, these are the results, obviously. And this is the, the, um, the, the JSON that it's processed. Yeah. So I wrote up some code, supplied my API key, Google Colab. I supplied the URL for uh, the discussion in Canvas and it pulled out uh, all the posts I saved as a JSON uploaded here. Got it. And then I'm just talking to the JSON file or you know, talking to the bot. Sure. Um, so I said, remove all references to student names. It's, so it's now after this stage, it does not have any, any reference to the real student names. And I'm, I'm verifying, saying, okay, what did Vishal Sadev say? He said, no, he, you know, Got I don't it. know, this guy doesn't exist anymore. Um, so just testing, so it's, you know, it's pretty good. Uh, and I was going a little bit deeper and saying, okay, do I need to worry more about privacy? So, you know, skip that. Let's get to some other question, right? So give me the nouns for each student in one table. Uh, right? So I, I have 29, that. but technically they should work for... 100, 200, 300 students, it's only limited by the size of the file it can accept. 
right? Now you can imagine that if you had 30 posts, what would it take for you to get this? And I didn't have to write any code for this. Yeah, I, so, I, I would imagine, like you said, um, you're a busy, you know, when you think about you as a professor, right? You've got lots of different responsibilities. Just being able to synthesize, like you said, you'd, you would have to have gone through and read 30 something posts, right? And then how do I really kind of organize that? So I really get a snapshot and can get really intimate, right? And, and personalize with that particular student. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll quickly run through some of the other questions. Uh, you know, can you convert the JSON to a CSV? This didn't work, though it thinks it, it can do it, but it can provide the code so I can do it offline. Uh, GPT code interpreter is better at this, but you know that was not the major thing I wanted here. Um, so all of this is it's just making up, right? It can't really do files right now. It can't export files, uh, but I'm sure soon it'll uh, get there. Uh, so then I gave it some context, right? Because I had just given it um, uh, the introduction post. It didn't know where what these students were learning. So I gave it some stuff from the outline, uh, you know, what they're studying. And I said, okay, I need to write personalized emails to them using their introductions to show them how topics in the course to, can relate to their interests, right? I said, three students, 200 words, right? So if you remember, I, I don't think I'll scroll up because it takes forever, yeah. but the first student was Alex, you know, had some eight nouns. And here's the email that the bot wrote. Right. Um, <laughs> so I mean, I let people read it, but there's references to IT infrastructure, productivity, um, you know, and the, the, I think the next one is actually even better. So this student had interest in statistics, health, uh, family. Uh, so, you know, we're talking about data modeling, business intelligence, data mm -hmm. mining, and these are all topics they're going to learn about. Uh, wearable tech, health apps, tech and fitness. Now, I would never be able to do this yeah. at scale. Yeah, for sure. Right. And so this, if it goes out to the students at the end of the first week, they're motivated, right? Say, so, yeah, this makes sense, right? I'm going to learn something because they may not take up a career in tech. This is an introductory course, uh, you know, required for business minors or for people in, you know, a particular major. Sure. Uh, what you need is them to engage. So this might be one way, right? So this is student engagement. Uh, I think I've asked, um, no, that's, I think that's probably where I was trying to look at my wife's LinkedIn account and see if it could analyze that and do something. You know, maybe mm -hmm. I have the fed uh, student LinkedIn accounts, but LinkedIn accounts are uh, private. Yeah. So it, it can't really uh, right. get in. So, but yeah, that was, that was the attempt. So yeah, I guess that gives you the instructor uh, using Part. these tools for insights. Yeah. yeah, no, that's, that's really fascinating. And, you know, just that last piece where, right, every one of these students, right, each of them are unique, they have unique interests. And as you said, they're going to be learning things, but they want to know, like, how am I actually going to apply these right to my unique career goals and, and the path yeah. that I choose. Right. And I think, um, I think that's really kind of genius about being able to tease kind of those things out, make it very personal. As, as you said, like you're doing this experiment with 30 people, um, but right. Scaling this course to, right. You said hundred, 200 people, right. You'd never being able to do that and being able to certainly leverage, you know, your time and your expertise as a professor. Um, you know, that's, that's re very interesting. Yeah. Um, and so, right, you, you've, you've been doing this course, and, you know, perhaps you can just say, um, you know, what have you learned so far as a, you know, as a, as a professor, professor teaching this course, you know, you shared the example where, right, the one you just showed around being able to, to leverage and empower and kind of do more. What other, what other thoughts um, that you've learned so far? Yeah, I think uh, the the benefit from all these experiments and i guess for people who want to try this is keep in mind that you know first you need to learn and the only way you can learn is by trying and of course you can read uh stuff and 
you know, there are quite a few uh, academics who are actively writing about it. You know, Ethan Mollick at Stanford is a favorite uh, to follow and read. Uh, but it's not just you. You know, we might think students know about these tools a lot, but they need coaching on how to use them well. So I would say, you know, start small, try stuff yourself, and always think about coaching students on how to use the tools and don't assume that mm-hmm. just because you've tried it, they will know how to do it, right? Um, and of course, in this case, we've looked at students using this tool and then faculty getting insights from this tool. Uh, I've also explored using these tools, again, a customized bot, customized with a particular assignment, with a particular rubric, uh, maybe trained with some model uh, submissions and use that as a way for students to get feedback on their own uh, submissions, right? So you can think of Mm. before a student submit, go talk to the bot, submit your output to them, and it will give you feedback, almost like a virtual TA. And if you flip that script, you can think about, can that bot help you grade student submissions in a large enrollment class, right? So whichever way you want to take it, I think it works better if you use it as a feedback mechanism. Uh, Or the student. Assuming your rubric is, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Now I was going to say, just so I understand, you're saying in the scenario where I'm a student, I've prepared, let's say, my assignment. Are, are you talking about providing that to kind of this virtual TA for getting some feedback to then improving, improving the, the the assignment? Yeah. So you know, I've tried this for one activity last week. Train the bot with the assignment instructions, a well-defined rubric, a model submission, and guidelines on the bot on how to respond to the student. And the student sets up a private chat in one channel with the bot, feeds the bot their uh, submission, and the bot gives it evaluation on each point in the rubric and um, gives it gives yeah. the student uh, uh, guidelines on hey you know you might be missing something your word length might word limit might be off or you haven't really answered this question very well. Now, still to be evaluated, you know, how effective that is, because I haven't done a follow-up survey um, on, you know, what the student experience right. has been using this particular tool. So that's still, you know, a question to be sure. answered, but that's what experiments are for. So that's sure. another way to sort of explore. And really, you know, there's there's so much white space, you really just have to try yeah, no, I love that idea, right? Because you, you just don't even know what's possible, right? Yeah. Yeah. With with some of these things and with you know these the technologies just changing really so fast and and making it very easy, as you said. Even if you're not, if you're a professor who doesn't have a deep technical background, being able to right automatically generate the actual code, the API information, uh, right? You'd be surprised what you're able to to learn even just doing that. Yeah. Um, and so how do you, you know, based upon what you've learned really so far, right? How do you, how do you see kind of the classroom evolving here into the near future? Yeah, I think the, you know, the initial idea when I thought about changing this course was saying, okay, what if we assume that the textbook is not needed, right? So, uh, you know, of course, this was a introductory course, broad, not deep. But if you think about the capabilities of the models and what you can either assume their background knowledge exists or you can actually customize these models, right? It's it's now trivial to train a bot with a 700-page chemistry textbook, right? I've tried that for my uh, kids' high school, you know, curriculum open textbook PDF download and, you know, train the bot and it can pretty much answer most of the questions, you know, still iffy on some of the complicated math, but every day they're improving. So stretch that sort of argument a bit further and say, you know, every day assume that the knowledge base available to the bot and, you know, when you look at Google Bard and Bing and they're all talking about real-time internet access. So technically you can say that you know, the knowledge of the world real time is available. 
So stretch that out and say, assume that all knowledge is available instantaneously to everyone and very soon compressed small enough that it can fit on your phone as well. You don't really need internet access. So, you know, uh, lag time is not a question. Then what's the role of a teacher, right? So I'd like to think of, you know, the teacher versus, you know, curate versus, you know, now create knowledge, right? Um, you know, of course, we've all, all, always had this transition, which has already happened when we moved online is that you're no longer the sage on the stage, but you're the guide on the side. Mm. But I think we are getting a little further out where you're essentially a curator of uh, an experience that you want the students to have and certainly still a guide, but it's almost you don't have to create new stuff anymore in most cases. And as as the knowledge base becomes better and better and your ability to curate that experience becomes easier, yeah. then all you're really worried about is making sure that students are meeting the learning objectives and, uh, you know, in, in sort of in support of that, because learning, I think, still is a is a interpersonal experience, whether that experience be with you as an instructor or with a group of students. So I, I like to think of, you know, sort of instructors as community managers, particularly when you're thinking of, you know, asynchronous online, though, even in face to face, I think the the ability of the instructor to motivate you know, students to uh, to go after their own learning goals, to mm. help others to work, you know, for groups to work with each other. So I guess curation versus creation and then sort of the role as a community manager. Yeah, I, li I, uh, I really like that. Right? Yeah, no, I, I like that. In, that's really kind of an interesting evolution, right? And <laughs> There's probably some creation, right? I don't think you're saying yeah. there's not, but but right where you maybe have some deep expertise in a space, but you're you're really becoming that yeah that 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 expert curator, right? Who's deep in an area and thinking, you know, how do I want this to be a really interesting, unique, personalized experience for my students who may have right? They come from different backgrounds. They they they're maybe at different spots, as you said. And even in the course you're teaching right now, some might be technical, non-technical, right? And being able to kind of tailor that and that experience. As you said, it's almost like, how do I create this, right, experience for, right, these, these students? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, that's going to become most important. Uh, and that's where I guess we need to rethink, um, you know, what we're doing in the classroom and also in terms of evaluation, right? If if knowledge and almost like the ability to solve any problem is available with a sentence, then what are you testing, right? Are you testing, I mean, I, I still don't have an answer to that, right? How do we make sure that students, because, you know, it's sort of like a chicken and egg, right? You say that students, you know, everybody says that, you know, asking the right question is the most important skill but you can't really figure out the right questions unless you understand the basics, understand the domain, and you've right. done some work, maybe an apprenticeship, you know, that's why we yeah. call them, you know, internships. Now, if every question can be answered, every problem can be solved, how do you get students to learn to ask the right questions? Yeah. You know, and which gets you back to, that's where you have internships and that you have, you know, training programs. But if if a firm is able to say that I don't need interns because GPT or equivalent can be my intern, so that's sort of the gap. And I think uh, the only way we can train students now is focusing on real world outputs, right? So it's no longer enough to submit a report. You know, in, in this case, you might as well submit an app. Mm. Right. It's no longer good enough to submit a business plan. I want to see a working app. And because you have these power tools at your disposal, our job is to give them the frameworks, expose the tools, and expect them to do 10x of what we expected them to do, and then actually deliver a working prototype. Interesting. Um, 
and yeah. you know that sort of broadly under the experiential learning umbrella and then you can figure out that more of your assessment is the process and of course if you're making them create something tangible you know whether it's a virtual digital project you know in the in, in, with ar or you know vr mm -hmm. if not a physical product you can actually evaluate the outcome as well but i think we are more likely to benefit from focusing on the process rather than the outcome yeah. given that everybody can get a reasonably good outcome yeah that's that's interesting i like that and so what i hear you saying is like as a student, right? If I'm a student in your classroom, right? There's expect, there's a high, there's a, you know, like you said, 10x expectation that I'm not just in the course and I'm not just like handing in my last assignment, maybe when I went to college, right? But really kind of taking that to the next level because of the availability of these tools and actually producing something that is a, is a prototype or a working concept that shows and demonstrates how you've kind of taken and learned and gone through the process to actually create something that is in a position to deliver value. Yeah, I think that's what we got to try for, for every course. Yeah. And students, you know, got to learn how to learn rather than learning math or chemistry or physics. Yeah. And yeah. actually there's a, I think there's a nice course on Coursera, very popular called learning how to learn. Learning how to learn. Yeah, because yeah, you, you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah. To your point, like, how do you even know what the right questions are to to ask at, at this point, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. It, it requires some kind of base knowledge around, right, the domain, some, some maybe some popular frameworks and, and so forth. Um, and so I, I like this bar that you're setting as a professor, as I, I was listening to you, like, hey, it's a 10x, right? It's 10x, yeah. right? And I would imagine that, the value to the student, right, of actually creating something real and tangible really puts them in a much better position to, right, enter their workforce uh, and, and be in a position to say, hey, I know how to create value because here's my examples of courses that I actually took that either produced an app or did this. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Um, what else? I, I, you know, I know you mentioned, um, uh, Ethan Mollick from, um, from Wharton and, um, it kind of, you know, as yeah. we were just kind of talking, if I'm looking at his seven ways of just reading them here and I, and I like these because I think they, they reinforce, right. Some of the things that you're talking about here around these kind of seven ways, um, he's got mentor, tutor, coach, teammate, student, simulator tool, right. The ways yeah. that the, the ways of you using AI in the classroom, um, and I think you, you touched upon certainly some of these, as you talked about, like even this one of kind of mentoring and coaching, right. These students through this experience, right. Giving them motivations, giving them maybe insights, knowing them personally around maybe where they are, some of their own personal, uh, interests. Um, yeah. Any, any kind of thoughts around kind of these seven ways, maybe around how you're applying them or maybe how you will apply them. Sure. I mean, I encourage all all the listeners here to subscribe to his uh, Substack. Uh, you know, amazing experiments that he's doing, and he's often gets access to many of these tools before they are publicly available. So you almost get to sort of learn from his experiments before you actually have access to those tools, and you can sort of get get ready and you know try out stuff and. I actually shared this seven ways article with the students and said, you know, this is a great way to think about the different things uh, a bot can do for you. And here are some of the ways we will actually be using it, right? So, I mean, the tutor aspect we've seen, you know, students can ask the bot questions and the bot gives a lot of, you know, verbose feedback. And I use that in some of my assignments saying, you know, we're talking about network effects. So, so I say, uh, think about three products or services that you use in your daily life that exhibit network effects, and then talk to the bot to get feedback on, you know, how they leverage network effects, how they, uh, you know, if you can figure out switching costs, you know, how they build loyalty, da 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 da. Uh, and by the end of that, 
the students have probably read, you know, maybe a thousand words, 1500 words, which is probably way more than they would have read in the textbook because sure. yes, I did put a quiz there, they had to read the textbook, but you know, I don't know how much they actually read all of the textbook. But here when they're having a sort of a back and forth with a bot, which looks in many cases, you know, you mistake it for a human, they're reading about a framework, a concept applied to three companies and 99% accurate, right? Sure. Uh, and then I'm asking them to synthesize and say, pick one, validate all the information the bot gave, cite the sources, right? So search and figure out what, what source you can cite for that. And then bring that into the course website and then discuss with others. So that's sort of, uh, yeah. you know, it's a, it's a teammate, it's a simulator. We did a simulated debate. So I think four or five of these roles we were able to use, and certainly he talks about risks as well, right? What are you going to evaluate if you're going to use, uh, you know, the bot to do most of the thinking? So you gotta, you know, gotta play around with what the student does, how you evaluate, how much tracking you do. So that's why I use Discord and not chat GPT or Bing because I have access to the transcripts of all those channels. And you know, the developer mm -hmm. created an interface for me to download all of that. So that comes as JSON and then I can feed it now, you know, now into Claude 2 and analyze that. Yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting, right? That um, just the point you made, right? As the professor teaching this, right? Being able to have access to all of those discussions that are going on and, and teasing things out. And um, right, as you were just, just you know, as you were describing this, um, really experience around the a textbook, right, versus you know, this experience, which is collaborative, right? As well as this this ability to, okay, let's discuss this framework and then let's actually apply it, right, to something real. And it it it'd be very hard to do that, right, in a in a text textbook type experience, you can certainly learn about the framework, but then you're going to have to create some other forum, right? And some other ways for people to demonstrate how this gets applied in the example that you just did around kind of applying this to three companies. Yeah. Um, well, good. So if, I guess if I'm a student and I don't have, let's say, uh, you know, um, I'm not very savvy yet with some of these tools. What would be your recommendation? Because you just said, um, you know, one of the things you're doing is right helping, uh, and as a professor, helping some of these students get kind of up level their their skills. Anything come to mind? I mean, if the surveys that we are seeing about student use of these tools, uh, instructors think students are using it less. Students are using it a lot more. So that's sort of a word of caution as well, right? Don't, uh, students are, you know, 70, 80% are probably already using it. Many of them are using it in ways that actually hurts their learning. Mm -hmm. So, and you're not going to be able to figure out when they're actually using it because most of the plagiarism tools don't catch it, you know, a lot of false positives. Um, so for students, I guess it's important to focus on uh, learning how to use these tools. And, you know, broadly speaking, you know, if you search up prompt engineering, you'll find a lot of tips and tricks. Uh, in terms of the uh, appropriate interfaces, of course, you have ChatGPT as a free version. I think Bing uh, with its uh, chat is free and accessible to everyone, essentially all over the world. Uh, so I would say the, and that actually has internet access as well. So, you know, Google Bard is getting there. That's also free. But I think right now, still, mm -hmm. if you want a free, pretty good uh, bot, which has access to the web, I think Bing and actually Bing Creative Mode mm -hmm. has GPT-4 running behind the scenes. So I would say play around with that um, and make sure that you always cite the bot as well in your uh, submissions. And uh, yeah, if you want to go deep, you know, search about prompt engineering and learn how to talk to these bots better. 
Great. Um, well, Professor, I've learned a lot on this uh, through this discussion. It really seems fascinating. Obviously, you're on the cutting edge of right uh, bringing AI into the classroom, learning it, about it as a professor, right? Learning about how do you really improve the learning experience for all the students going through your, your curriculum. Um, thanks for sharing all of your insights. Um, any kind of final thoughts of anything else you'd want to share with with people, whether it be uh, you know other people teaching at institutions or students? Yeah, I think the uh, all these you know, experiments over the past four or five months have shown me that uh, the tech is moving so fast that you almost don't need to be limited by the ideas that you can mm. imagine, right? So you can almost say, I want this vision of the future. And if not today, like three weeks later, it might be possible, right? right. Of course, if you want to do a lot more experiments, you know, hire a student, you know, a code savvy student or something, because nobody needs to be code savvy, but you at least need to understand how to, you know, create an app and provision some infrastructure in the cloud. So as long as you have a reasonably capable, you know, student developer, and it's very cost effective to hire students and they learn some useful skills that will get them a job. So, you know, find a little pot of money. If you're, you know, if you're an instructor, not much, you know, you can do a lot of stuff by yourself. You know, I, I don't write code regularly and <laughs> GPT-4 wrote the code for me to pull stuff out of Canvas, Canvas. and then I just you know, used it in Claude 2, you know, and Claude 2 is free. So, um, so if you want to do more, hire a student um, and then keep experimenting. And I think it's a good idea to always write. And, you know, I started a newsletter. We'll put a link in the mm -hmm. show, show notes. notes. Uh, write about your experience. Any student who works with me, I said, write about your experience. So students yeah. who are working with me on the team, I have a developer, Rohan and another student who signed up and, you know, we've done that for the blockchain projects as well. I always encourage them to write as part of their process. And I'm trying to do that uh, as well. So iterate, yeah. get a little bit of money and I'm not talking thousands of dollars, right? You can, you, know, you need some money to sign up for some of these paid services, uh, maybe out of your own pocket or if the university funds it. We are lucky to have leadership that, supports are the experiments so you know i went to the leadership and said okay i'm going to try this uh, i don't have time to wait for it vendors or yeah. our own it unit to get this started you know i have students i can hire give me some money is that here right <laughs> go for it uh, now that kind of leadership may or may not exist everywhere but it's not a yeah. heavy expense to get started uh, so that's yeah. that would be my tip that you know imagine a future and it's not going to take five years, three weeks, maybe four weeks, and you'll have the tools to actually have a crude prototype. And then maybe you can find somebody to actually put it into production. Production. Yeah. yeah. So I think those are excellent suggestions. And, you know, I love the, your, your themes here around experimentation, iteration, right? And I think sometimes people think that the bar is so high when in fact, you'll find that it really isn't, right? Um, there's, there's so many courses that are available for free. And I love the approach that you're taking, which is right. Having a, a student work with you who needs and wants to understand all these technologies and certainly is motivated. Plus, um, you know, someone who can perhaps, uh, give you feedback as a professor around what would they want, right. As a, as a particular student, uh, around this new environment you're creating. Professor Vishal, it was a, a pleasure of having you. I learned a lot uh, through this discussion. You're, you're certainly a pioneer, uh, really uh, leveraging these tools and helping all this, the students in your classroom. So um, I just wanted to say thanks for, for making a little bit of time. Perhaps we, we have a round two sometime uh, to really kind of see how right, this, this technology is, is really evolving at the university. Yeah, thank you for having me. I look forward to sharing more experiences as we learn more. <laughs> all right. All right. Thank you, Professor. Right, thank you. Take care.